Okay, everybody, welcome back. I guess I should welcome myself back. It is 629, so we'll start in one minute. Dr. McCarty, you can go ahead and um, turn on your screen share and get your presentation up. So I want to welcome everybody again, and uh, we have a great talk tonight with Dr. McCarty. She talked to us, I think it was back in February, on uh, pests and diseases and trees. She She's a great source of knowledge and information. She's also a tree climber herself. She likes to get up in the canopy. She gets her students up in the canopy, so she keeps herself pretty busy. And I'm really excited about tonight's presentation. I, you know, we get so many questions about pesticide use from customers and, and such, and she's going to give you the science behind this. And we're so lucky to have such a great partnership with the University of Georgia, and they just provide us with this information so we can speak to our clients informatively. So with that, Dr. McCarty, thank you so much for being here tonight, and it's all yours. I will go ahead and keep looking at questions if there's in the Q&A. If there are any, do you want me to wait till the end or go ahead? Uh, and let's, let's wait to the end so then we can have time for a, a good discussion of everything. Excellent. Okay. Well, go ahead. It's all yours. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for being here tonight. I, I will say I'm a, I'm a baby tree climber. Being faculty doesn't always give me the time I want to get up in the canopy, but when I can, it's awfully nice. So this talk is on pesticide policy uses and risk. I started giving this talk because I realized that there was a, I and others realized that there's a, a big disconnect between what is true of pesticide policy and risk and what the general public thinks and believes to be true. And as arborist and as, as providing services for the public, a lot of times you're having to speak to that with your clients. So the, the front picture we have this gentleman and he's got a mask on and a sprayer on his back. And it, just look at, for, look at it for just a minute. Do y'all see anything that is missing? Let's see if I can get my slides to advance. My slides don't wanna advance guys, sorry. There we go. He's missing some gloves. So part of using pesticides correctly would be to use them safely. All right, for an outline, a free public sort of message about Asian longhorn beetle, just a couple of slides, because I can't have a group of arborists on the, on the Zoom and not mention it. Some definitions from perspectives about pesticides and pesticide risk, regulatory information, what's involved in getting a pesticide label. Despite some public opinion, companies just can't produce whatever they want and start selling it. A couple of examples, I'll use glyphosate and uh, neonicotinoids to talk about some disconnects between what is the real story and what does the public believe and why, why are there those differences? And then some comments about pesticides used on trees and information on the Georgia Pest, Con Pest Management Handbook. And so I have put the link to the trees chapter in the chat that was I did an overhaul on it um, about three years ago, so that should be pretty up-to-date information. Asian longhorn beetle, it is an invasive insect. This is one to keep your eye out for. It is not currently in Georgia, and we don't want it to be in Georgia. If it does come to the Georgia, the sooner we can find it, the best chance we have of eradicating those infestations. They are big. The adults are three quarters of an inch to one and a half inches long. And just like most boring insects, larvae will girdle trees and stems, tree trunks and, and stems. They feed under the wood. The picture right here that the finger's pointing to is the damage that the female does whenever she's laying an egg. She just chews out this notch to put the egg in. It's very similar to what you would see for pine sawyers. And then the exit holes are quite large. Like many of these other, like emerald ash borer and other wood boring pests that are not native, probably introduced in wood packing materials. It does prefer maple species and has other hosts, including horse chestnut, willows, elms, birches, and poplars. So some, some trees that we have here, really it, it hits on maples. So this is not the time to discount a maple that looks like it has just a native wood bore in it. Just stop and pay a little bit more attention. If you think it could potentially be an Asian longhorn beetle infestation, the, first, the next step would be to please contact your county agent. There are currently have been infestations in Illinois, Ohio, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and South Carolina. Some of those states have eradicated those infestations. That is where USDA APHIS moves in, takes control of the operation, and they actually take the infested area as well as a buffer of uninfested trees, and they remove every host tree from that area. 
It is an incredibly large endeavor. People get their yard treats cut whether they want it or not to try to keep this from spreading. And this is one of those kind of like with Emerald Ash Board, don't move firewood. This is how these things move around. So that was for free. Keep your eyes open for that one. And, and now back to the heart of the talk. So what is a pesticide? A pesticide is a chemical that is used to kill an undesirable organi organism. So that's a really broad um, topic. Pesticides could be fungicides, rodenticides, herbicides, and, and I'll focus on insecticides for this talk because I'm an entomologist. The US EPA is over registration of insecticides. And so ingredients on an insecticide are broken into active ingredients and inert ingredients. Active ingredients, that's the, the killing agent of the pesticide. It prevents, destroys, repels, or mitigates a pest. So that is, is what's actually doing the killing. And the active can, ingredient can also act as a pent regulator, defoliant, desiccant, and nitrogen stabilizer. So a lot of things go under that umbrella. And the inert ingredients are all of the other ingredients like solvents, surfactants, defoaming agents. So a lot of times the inert ingredients are not listed on the label. Well, they're not. And, and that's because that's proprietary information. The company that gets the permit and gets the license for that pesticide, they have kind of made their special recipe in the inert ingredients and they don't want to put that on the label and give it away for free. However, the EPA does know the content of all of the pesticide ingredients. And so that is sometimes a myth that I hear that the EPA doesn't know all of the ingredients in the pesticide, and that's just not correct. An insecticide is specifically a chemical substance that's used to kill insects. And so I mentioned that, and that's a lot of what I'll talk about, although I will be discussing glyphosate and the cancer scare, because that is one that I know that y'all are most likely hearing about from your clients. And so let's, let's do a couple of, of definitions. A hazard is something that has the capacity to do harm. And there are many different hazards in our life every day that we don't think about. The second we get on a road with a car, that's hazardous. I'm about to put a teenager in a car by herself driving. That's a hazard and it's a scary one, but one we typically don't think about very much. All right, so hazard... Something being a hazard just means that the capacity to do harm is there. Now let's take a step further and talk about risk. Risk is the hazard times the exposure level. And you may have heard an expression called the dose makes the poison. That means how much of something you get really determines how risky it is for you. So when EPA assesses a pesticide, they look at the risk, not just the hazard. However, there are other organizations and regulatory entities in other countries that only look at hazards. So it's important whenever you look at things perhaps coming out of Europe, like Europe bans this, but the U.S. doesn't, just be aware that they may be using a hazard-based assessment, whereas the EPA uses a risk-based assessment. And the goal of pesticide labels and safely using pesticide is to minimize the risk. There is never a time where any action we take could have zero risk. If I mop the floor, there's a chance that I could slip on it and fall. So there is some risk in many things, and we want to act to minimize that risk. So let's talk through a couple of risk scenarios. The hazard is Clorox. It's a chemical that is under my sink. We use it all the time. We clean with it. And what if I got an exposure of two cups of, of bleach? That is a really high, high risk. If I drank two cups of bleach, it would not go well for me. It's that hazard and the exposure combined. What if I had just a microliter of it? That's pretty low risk. The chances of that causing problem if I ingested a microliter is, is incredibly low. Let's change my exposure route and put that microliter in my eye. Now the risk has gone up a little bit more because the exposure route is different. How about water? We have to have water to survive. And if I drank a gallon of water a day, that risk would be really low. But what if I drank 10 gallons of water? That's not gonna end well for me either. The hazard hasn't changed, but the exposure has. So that's just some, some hazard versus risk to think through. And so as I talk through these items, as you think about these things with 
your clients, there are some very simple things that we can do to minimize our risk, minimize our exposure. And PPE, mixing pesticides correctly, applying at the right time, those are all things that are on the pesticide label and they are put there to minimize the risk of having a problem. So when a pesticide gets registered with the EPA, the EPA will develop a risk assessment that's gonna evaluate the potential of that compound to harm humans, wildlife, plants, and surface and groundwater. So it's not just does this pesticide kill this pest on a crop, but what are all the other potential non-target impacts? And a non-target impact is an impact on anything that is not the intended target of the pesticide. And so I talk about this stuff a lot um, because my research involves both pesticide use and pesticide risk. So I spend a lot of time between that rock and hard place. For harm to humans, the EPA considers short-term toxicity. So that's something that would be a problem within 24 hours of exposure and then long-term effects. And for pesticide applicators, this is particularly important because this would be the effects of using a product over many decades. So those things are taken to account in EPA risk assessments. And then the EPA will evaluate and approve the language that appears on each pesticide label. So that's not something that the pesticide company puts out in isolation without EPA input. When a company puts in an application, they put in what's in the, what's in the product, potential risk and residues on food, as well as wildlife and other environmental effects, proof of manufacturing process being reliable, directions for use, and then the EPA will put a notice of receipt in the federal register, and which that does is that makes it public knowledge at that point. And then the EPA will dig further into risk management and making those regulatory decisions. What do the risk assessments say? Are there other alternative registered pesticides that would fit that need? How can we mitigate risk? How can we reduce that risk? Should the product or its labeling be modified? And on and on. And, and all these are, are put here just so that you understand and can convey that a lot of work and a lot of information goes to getting a pesticide available for um, registered use as well as uh, public use. So how toxic are pesticides? Is, is any pesticide just the same in toxicity? Not at all. There is a system that the EPA has developed to evaluate toxicity. But again, the general public is largely unaware of this. What they see on social media, what they hear on the news is stuff like this. I'm wearing a mask right now, but I bet these will make a great healthy salad later. With this picture, is, the intent of this is to scare people. Um, that's all this is. This is a fear tactic. But this does not take into account is on the pesticide label is a reentry time. So once this pesticide is applied, no one can go into that field without the proper PPE for a set amount of time. And that amount of time is based on the breakdown of the pesticide. There's also something called a post-harvest interval. And that is the time between pesticide application and when that product can be harvested. And that is based on residues of the pesticide in foods and being sure that products don't get to market with unsafe levels of pesticide. But the public largely doesn't know that and they see these memes and they're scared. And being concerned about what pesticide is in the environment and in, the food, in their food is not a bad thing. Built-in pesticides can't be washed off, it's in the food. And we have a child eating corn. The corn, the, the truth is that this corn would be, have been treated with Bt. It's a insecticide that's in the corn, yes, it's a GMO, and it is one that targets lepidopteran pests. It does not target any kind of pathway that we have in our systems, and it will cause no harm to this child. But a scared mom could read this and be scared that something that she feeds her kid would hurt them. We've got Roundup, it's a killing machine, and there's, I can't see the top, but I believe this meme has crows on it and a pile of human bones, which is very, very dramatic. This is another one on glyphosate. How long, I can't read all of this, so you'll have to excuse me, but it talks about glyphosate in water, and so how long can it stay viable in amniotic fluid, and, and starts to make um, connections that shouldn't be made. And this is moms across America. They have some really nice, memes that are entertaining. And there's one on one of the gentlemen who, are in, who was involved in the Roundup lawsuit. 
And let me just say, we'll talk about Roundup. We'll talk about cancer. I have nothing but sympathy for cancer patients, but we do have a lot of, of misinformation about this particular compound. If this is the new childhood in America, and it lists all these things that are problematic in America. And, you know, are you concerned? Find out more about GMOs and toxic chemicals. My favorite toxic herbicide, a mix of glyphosate and ancient orange. And then the natural pest control manual, because we should be able to kill pests without anything that's toxic. And understand that if something is not toxic, it doesn't have the ability to kill. That's what toxicity is. It's the ability to kill something. And any kind of a pesticide has the ability to kill something. That's why it's used as a pesticide. So the word toxic really gets misused quite often. So let's go back just very briefly. There's a lot in this um, table, and I just want to get the concept across, is that Every pesticide has a signal word. And it, when you look at that label, it's that first thing on there. It'll say warning and, and things like that. That pesticide is associated with a risk category that is based on different categories of effects that a pesticide could have. So categories four is very low. And it takes the notice that as we move from the right to the left, these numbers get um, smaller. So it means that there less of that compound is needed to cause a problem. So there's low, that's category three. That's where you would see caution on the label. Category two is a moderate risk and there's warning on the label. And then high is danger. That's the most toxic category of pesticides. It is in category one. And as pesticides move up the scale, there's increased PPE that would be needed, increased post-harvest interval, increased re-entry times, more restrictions on what these pesticides can be used on. So this is a, a big one too. I'm gonna talk through this because some of it's hard to read, but there's category four. An example is spinosad. And here are some everyday products that we use in our life or products that are in the environment that we're putting things in con context between the pesticide, the category four, other things that have the same toxicity as category four is citric acid, sucrose, water, ethanol, and glyphosate, the one that we're so scared of. That's all has similar toxicities as category four. Category three, that's caution. So we're going up a step in, in toxicity or severity. There are numerous different pesticides here. I've underlined the ones that show up in the tree section of the Georgia Pest Management Handbook. So imamectin benzoate, if you're doing trunk injections, you're likely using these. Bifenthrin, BP, BT, sorry, pyrethrins, carbaryl, mineral oil, neem oil, imidacloprid, and kale and clay. Other compounds that are in that same risk belt would be baking soda, table salt, aspirin, hydrogen peroxide, and a compound found in chocolate. Category two, malathion, abamectin, rotenone, which is it's an insecticide and can also be used for other pesticide need. And it's also one that is, has been approved for organic production. Copper sulfate is a fungicide and caffeine, which is something that probably most of us use every day. And lastly, category one, this is the extremely toxic one. Notice that none of these are underlined. None of these are used on trees. Aldicarb, Nalid. Nalid is used for mosquito control sometimes. And then we have DDT, nicotine, cyanide, vitamin D, which a lot of us take every day. Aflatoxin and botulin, which sometimes we inject in our face. So these things all look scary, but again, it's the dose makes the poison. It is that risk the toxicity of something times the exposure. Let's talk about glyphosate and cancer. And so it is most popularly known as round. And there's lots of scary means out here with people's skin coming off their face and tractors with skulls on it and, and crows flying around. That, that comes up quite often in these. So what is glyphosate? It is a broad spectrum herbicide. Again, first marketed under the trade name of Roundup. It was registered in 1974. It is the most widely used herbicide. It stops a production, um, protein production enzyme pathway in plants. We don't have this pathway that, that glyphosate disrupts. 
It doesn't vaporize very easily. It's not soil active. So, you know, some herbicides are soil active. If you apply it, then things are going to be dying on that soil for a while. That is not the case with glyphosate. And like many other pesticides, when it is in the soil, it's degraded by bacteria. Glyphosate, yes, it is a lower risk pesticide. That doesn't mean that anybody should be cavalier with any pesticide use. We should always follow the label, always use proper precautions, follow the label carefully, look at the weather, look at what the wind's doing, and, and again, not be cavalier with any kind of a pesticide. Glyphosate doesn't penetrate the skin well, and the, the skin penetration actually peaks eight, afters, eight hours after exposure. So if PP is worn, then we don't have that skin exposure. We should always be washing our hands and any, you know, arms and everything after pesticide use, handling those clothing the right way, washing them the right way. So a lot of those things that we should be doing as good practices really minimizes the risk. If it does, if it is ingested, it leaves animals by bodily waste like most pesticides would do. It could cause vomiting, drooling, and GI issues. And again, this is the case for many, many compounds that you shouldn't have in your body would have these similar results. And again, we don't have the pathway that this compound disrupts. If you will take just a moment, and I'm gonna pause for this, please pull out your cell phones and Google glyphosate risk and what probably causes cancer means. Very specific. And what you will find is if you go to videos, there's a YouTube video. It's a yellow orangish um, color in the background, the YouTube video. It was produced by one of the weed science programs in the Midwest, and it has a great video. I'm not going to share this video because sharing videos often doesn't go well with PowerPoints, but it does a, an excellent job of explaining exactly what the cancer risk designation means that you've heard about. So in 2015, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is a part of the World Health Organization, designated glyphosate as probably carcinogenic to humans. I will note that the WHO itself since then has reassessed and said that glyphosate is, does not show a high risk of cancer to humans. So IARC does a lot of cancer risk assessments and they don't very often classify something as not being carcinogenic. Things usually go into those categories. Remember that this is a hazard assessment and not a risk assessment. So that's very different. They only assess the hazard. Does it have the capacity to do this and not the risk? Does it have the capacity at exposure levels? When this was all coming out, it was like watching a science soap opera, to be honest. The information that was included in this risk assessment was incredibly cherry-picked. So what that designation means is that they can't prove that it doesn't cause cancer. So think about that for just a minute. You can't prove that it doesn't cause cancer. And again, to get more information, go to that video I've had you Google. It, what it does not mean is that you can prove that it does cause cancer. So other things that are given that same designation by IARC includes art glass, glass containers, frying food, working as a hairdresser, malaria, red meat, shift work, sleep disruption, beverages over 65 degrees Celsius, and androgenic steroids. So a lot of things fit under that designation. And some of these are things that we use every day. So just keep that in perspective. And for comparison, their group one designation means that it does cause cancer. Again, according to their hazard assessment. And things that they classify as causing cancer, again, hazard, not risk assessment, is formaldehyde, ethanol and beverages, which a lot of people drink quite commonly, silica dust, coke production, engine exhaust, estrogen therapy, oral contraceptives, HIV, which does cause some odd cancers, mineral oils, working as a painter, processed meats, solar radiation, tobacco, so many other things. 
And I have pictures of fruit and vegetables at the bottom to make a point. These are all fruits and vegetables that naturally produce formaldehyde, which according to IARC is a group one carcinogen. I'm not gonna stop eating apples. I understand that that is a hazard assessment and that the amount of formaldehyde that naturally occurs in apples is not an amount that's gonna cause me any harm. In addition, the US EPA did, came out with a decades long risk assessment for glyphosate in 2017. And their end finding was that glyphosate was not likely carcinogenic to humans. And in fact, since the, the 2015 IARC designation, many other regulatory agencies redid their risk assessments for glyphosate. And they all rejected that glyphosate causes cancer. So just know that we're looking at one hazard assessment saying that you can't prove that it doesn't cause cancer as opposed to 19 regulatory and independent research organizations saying that no, this is not what the evidence says. The Roundup scare really gained traction in 2012 with the study that came out of France. It was later retracted and then republished and drama, drama. So that is some interesting Wikipedia if you ever get a chance to read it. But know that this, this scare really got traction with the study that was retracted. In 2021, the European Union put out a new report finding that only potential harm would be that applicators could face serious eye damage if the product is improperly applied. And again, that goes back to following the label. The label is the law. The label is the agreement to how to handle those products safely. So don't handle inappropriately. If you handle inappropriately, your risk of adverse things really, you know, changes. And then remember that a jury's decision does not substitute for scientific research or the judgment of independent scientists at regulatory agencies. So we're seeing a lot in the news about glyphosate causing cancer. We're seeing a lot of litigation attorneys have commercials out there. And just because a jury finds something doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. And it doesn't mean that they are assessing whether or not it's true. I'll also point to the agricultural health study this was launched over 25 years ago. It was a multi-agency university and multi-university study. They did surveys of farming practices and lifestyle and health of people who were farmers as well as family members. There were almost 90,000 participants that were surveyed three times. In addition, they dug in on special studies um, to get more data on things that seemed concerning. There are pesticides that are associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that's the one that we're hearing about with glyphosate. They include DDT, lindane, permethrin, diazinon, and understand that associated does not equal cause. That's a, a slight correlation. A lot of times these, some of these are slight. Glyphosate was not associated with risk. There's a couple of times where a slight correlation came up that was not statistically significant. So according to the American Cancer Society, the cause of most lymphomas is not known. And it's complicated because it's actually a diverse group of cancers, but the American Cancer uh, Society does list changes in genes, age, gender, ethnicity, and that whole list there as potential risk factors. Again, remember that a jury's decision is not the same as the consensus of scientific evidence. So let's talk about the cancer lawsuits just a little bit. And this is, this is a state of flux. It's ever-changing. I did some reading last week just to bring this presentation up to date because it's been about a year since I've given it. Cancer is sad. And regardless of what kind of cancer or the cause or any of this, patients need sympathy. So I've got a, a close family member who is living with cancer. So though I talk about the cancer lawsuits and the risk, understand that that is not done from a place of lack of sympathy for cancer patients. And I'm sure that if you have this, you wanna know why. And sometimes we don't always know those answers. At this point, there are thousands of litigants in the US claiming that glyphosate damaged their health. There's a couple of trials have happened and the IARC study has been used to present it to the jury, which again is based on hazard and not risk. And one of the patients said, you were getting it in your face every day. It was kind of unavoidable. And if you'd applied a pesticide and you've read a label, you know that that comment is not consistent with label juice. And quoting one of the litigation attorneys, 
Well, we have to prove it's not, yes, absolutely it causes cancer. That doesn't have to be proven to the jury. If the juries could conclude, I'm not so sure, but I think so, he said, we've met our burden. So understand that what is what a litigation attorney gets a jury to decide is very different than the consensus of scientific information. But it's hard for the public when they see a lot of news articles and only part of the story is being told. And they're seeing that part of the WHO said that it is listed as a 2A carcinogen and the public doesn't really understand what that means. So that is the glyphosate cancer risk. And I'll be glad to talk through more questions if you have them. But I also want to move to neonicotinoids and bees, because I realized that neonics are used on many different tree species. That may be a product that you're using, you know, imidacloprid or donateferon. I've done research on imidacloprid for almost 10 years. And I do both efficacy research and non-target research. So we can talk, we can dig into that in questions um, later on. Okay, today Europe banned bee killing neonicotinoid pesticides. Now it's our, our turn again. And it's interesting if you look at who produced some of these memes. So it's always important to consider the source either way. If it seems like it's anti-pesticides, anti-GMO, and it seems inflammatory, look at the source. If it seems really pro-pesticides, pro-GMO, and the information seems to be dismissive of risk and glossing over things, also always consider the source. And I recommend, you know, when you're looking for good information, go to sources that end in .edu and .gov. Use reputable sources when looking for this information. So neonicotinoids are a newer class of insecticides. They are now licensed in more than 100 countries with billions of dollar global market. Uh, Imidacloprid takes up most of that market. It was the first product that was uh, registered. It was the first to go off patent but there are other neonicotinoids and they're all listed there. Some of them are registered for ornamental use. Some of them are not. Nitefiron and imidacloprid are used in forest use. And if you want more information on that, I, again, the Georgia Pest Manual that I shared, and I'll go over the information in that later on, but it does contain information on registered use for different products. So this class of insecticides were developed as development started in the 1970s. And imidacloprid was synthesized in in 1985. So it took over 10 years to get the product that they decided to go with. It was registered in 1994, and then that bear patent expired in 2006, and now there are multiple different trade names that it can be found in. Imidacloprid, as well as many of the other neonics, has low toxicity to vertebrates and high toxicity to insects. And they were developed specifically for that low toxicity to vertebrates. It was part of efforts after the EPA was started and we had some of that, that movement to get safer pesticides on the market, market. And that's why this class of pesticides was developed, specifically because it has a low toxicity to vertebrates. It's biodegradable. It doesn't biomagnify in food change, which at this point, most insect pesticides should not. But again, the public is seeing stuff like this. We know what's killing the bees. They're poisoned by neonicotinoid insecticides. Tell the EPA to ban neonicotinoid pesticides before they devastate US bee populations. Again, the public is concerned about the health of insects, which is great because generally throughout most history, the public has just wanted to kill every bug they saw, which is bad. So I think it's great that the public cares about insect conservation. Any pesticide, unless it's um, a selective pesticide like Bt, is going to be toxic to bees, any kind of broad spectrum pesticide. So that is not something that is distinctive to neonicotinoid pesticides. And then it all comes back to proper use. And the public, you know, who wants conservation, who doesn't want to cause harm, is bombarded with bad information and pseudoscience they want the right decisions to be made, and they're also being scared by information that's not always accurate. Well, a lot of this concern for bees came, across, came from colony collapse disorder, which was first reported in 2006. Colony collapse disorder is an issue with honeybees, so a lot of what I'll be talking about is honeybees. Please understand that honeybees are an agricultural commodity. 
there are a, an insect livestock that are managed by people and do sometimes escape into the wild. They are not native. They are not a good indicator of ecosystem health. So when we talk about conservation, we need to make sure that the focus is on native bees and not honeybees. Not to knock on honeybees, there's a lot of good things about them, but they're not the best indicator of ecosystem health that we should be looking at. Colony collapse really was running 2006 to 2008. It was a major issue. And there have been some incidences, incidents since then, but not to that degree. It's a, dis, it's a very distinct phenomenon with the disappearance of adult bees, no dead bodies, evidence of recent brood rearing, and the queen is left behind. So a lot of times with pesticide kills, what we expect to see is a lot of dead bodies around. This is something entirely different. And entomologists still do not 100% know what caused colony collapse. There are other times in history that similar phenomenon have been described in 1906, in 1961 to 62, and, and in 79. We don't know if it occurred to that degree, probably, but as time goes on, we are keeping better records. Honeybees are having some issues. Yes, winter, winter hive survival is lower than it should be. So there's a lot more winter hive mortality issues. And the things that are responsible for bee declines, tracheal mite was introduced in the U.S. in 1984. That's an invasive species, and there's a picture of it on the bottom right-hand corner. And what they do is they clog up the breathing tubes of, for bees. Varroa mite, which is probably the biggest issue, came to the U.S. in 1987, and it also does transmit diseases. There's also issues of poor nutrition, lack of genetic diversity, migratory bee keeping, different pathogens, and pesticides. Pesticides, you know, it's a puzzle and there's lots of different pieces to it. And pesticides are one of the puzzles. And if they're not used correctly, absolutely, we can have some issues. And it may be that the EPA does change some labels. And, and some of that is with reason. And I'll show one of those label changes later on. That's a pretty reasonable safety measure. But lots of different things are affecting bees. A lot of these are specific to honeybees, like the migratory beekeeping. But a lot of the pathogens and parasites that affect honeybees can also affect native bees. Again, lots of information out there. Um, the EPA plans to wait until 2018 before reviewing the registration of neonicotinoids, but America's bees cannot wait three more years. Different pesticides are on registration review. The herbicides went through first. This was a change that happened in 2006, 2006 that all pesticides have to undergo registration review every 15 years. The herbicides were the first ones to go through and they're still in that process. And then the insecticides are on a different phase. They're, they're kind of trailing, but that registration review is in process and it takes years. So lots of different information on there. And, and the perspective is not always accurate. Sometimes there is some truth. Is, are neonicotinoids a bee-killing pesticide? Well, yes, but they're a pesticide. So that capacity is always there. There have been some policy changes for neonics. In 2013, the European Union did ban some pesticide use of neonics for two years, then reassessed and made some more decisions, and then chose to ban all neonic use. I will mention that there was a giant study that came out of this ban to assess effects. There were lots of different comparisons in bee communities. And what happened was in this giant study, 94% of the statistical comparisons showed no effect. 3% showed a positive effect. 3% showed a negative effect. But the paper that came out from it and the emphasis in the media was only on that 3% that showed a negative effect. So it's a complicated topic. And my covering it in this presentation only scratches the surface. This is one that you may have heard about in Wilson, or Wilsonville, Oregon. And this really sparked concern in the US. I was working on non-target impacts of imidacloprid during this time. And in Wilsonville, Oregon, 50,000 bumblebees were killed from an off-label application of donateferon. A tree was sprayed while it was bloomed by a commercial applicator who did not follow the label. That person lost their license, the company lost their license, it was an illegal application. But again, that was not, that information really was not imparted to the public. 
As a result, when the city of Eugene banned neonic use, the Oregon Department of Agriculture banned neonic use on linden trees. And that is a ban that has increased. And I'll show that label in just a minute. And that's a reasonable one. Over 50% of the EPA complaints for bee kills were on linden trees. It looks like that translocates really well to floral tissues. Now, you shouldn't be putting it on them and bloom anyway, but if they're using systemic treatments, then it would go to floral tissues. And that's a reasonable adjustment. That's, that's not without reason. There is now a pollinator safety labeling on product labels. So you may not have seen this 10 years ago, but now when you look at a neonic label, you will see this information on there. And again, the product label restrictions for applying it to Tilia species, which is not an unreasonable change. That it's not painting with a really broad brush. So a change that wouldn't be acceptable would be to ban all of the use, but maybe ban it in areas where the risk is higher. In addition, the Fish and Wildlife Service um, in 2016 said that they were going to phase out wild neonic use on wildlife refuges, which if you're trying to do conservation for things like emerald ash borer or hemlock woolly adulterate, it means that now those product, those um, conservation areas can't be protected. So let's look at some bee data just to talk through this a little bit more. So this is the number of beehives. This is 1961. This is food and agriculture organization data. This is when the data collection began. What it doesn't show is that there was a post-World War II increase in hives. And so over time, they were already declining. This is when we start to get some introduction. The, path of the parasitic mites, varroa mites, and tracheal mites are introduced at this time. And then we come down. This is neonic introduction to the market. And then we come over here, and this is colony collapsed as ardor. And those numbers, you know, did a bit of a dip. Again, this is a managed agricultural product. And so it's not just independent on its own. And it's a really not a great number of, of ecosystem effects. And I'll also mention the honeybee toxicity study. I've, I've put this in here just so I don't forget. There's a lot of talks. But this is e coming from EPA documents. And basically the effect is the time after application for only 25% of the bees to die. And so they sprayed fields with ins different insecticide products. And then three, eight, 24, 48 or hours after application, the leaves were harvested. They brought in and exposed the bees to that foliage. So think a Petri dish with a leaf on it and some beads on the leaf. Then they evaluated the time till only 25% of the bees died. And the purpose of this was to determine how long this insecticide residues remain toxic to bees? And that's a great question. So let's start. This is the hour until bee mortality was only 25%. And so I, and these are many different pesticides or insecticides. So lots of different ones were assessed. And over here is a neonic, it's clothionidin, and it is the top one. And it does have a lot of residual toxicity, absolutely. Here are three other insecticides that are neonics. So donatepheron, which is used in trees, imidacloprid is also used on trees, and thiacloprid. Chlorantranilopril is one, this is one that I'm researching that's supposed to have a better profile for bees, but lots of other products in here, imamect and benzoate, carbaryl, permethrin, so lots of different products. So just because something's a neonic does not mean that it is the most toxic product possible for bees. And then I've broken this down and I just rearranged it just to break it into the different insecticide classes. So you can see that, for instance, organophosphate, there's quite a lot of variety in toxicity to bees. And that's the same for neonics and the pyrethroids. So it's hard to make generalizations just based on the pesticide class. And I've also in here, these are some of the pesticides that are mentioned in the George. Georgia Pest Management Handbook, and notice that they are on the lower side of things. And lastly, pesticides and trees. Just a little bit of information. I'm not going into application techniques. We can talk about that if you're interested and have questions. Those are great for the discussion time. I did want to highlight information. So this is the Georgia Pest Control Manual. Again, the link has been posted in the chat. 
And this, the document will also be posted on GAA website. This document contains two different tables. First table will have the insect. So if you want to know what to use on an old ash borer or foliage feeding beetles or bagworms, first table, here's the pest, the management recommendation. And this is a list of all the pesticides that are registered for this use. And then specific remarks and precautions. So just some additional information. And then the second table, and this was the new one that we added um, when we updated this, list the insecticide, if it's restricted use, the mode of action, the labeled uses. So is this something only you can use on ornamentals? Can it be used in nursery settings and plantations and forest? And I like sometimes it may say forest and plantations, and they're they're listed different ways. Reentry time. So how long between when you apply that pesticide and when you can go back in that area? And then as a good practitioner for your clients, if you apply something and it has a 12-hour reentry time, please convey that information to your client. They don't need to go around it either. Their kids don't need to be rubbing their faces all over the tree where you just apply carbaryl. So please again, convey that information, the maximum application rate, instructions on mis mixing it. These are in 10 gallon mixtures. So you may not be using mixtures that are that, that large. This is largely um, for forestry practices, but again, a lot of these can be used on the ornamentals. And then lastly, I'll, the listed, uh, the pests that are listed on that label. So what can you use by Fentranon? It's all there for you. There are lots of different insecticides that are listed in that manual. They all can't be used on everything. There's lots of different modes of actions, labeled uses, restrictions, application, application methods, and reentry re time. None of these products are without risk. Note that even neem oil, organic pesticides like that, mineral oil, kale and clay are insecticides and they're class three insecticides. And they're gonna have the same safety precautions as other insecticides in that class. None of these are without risk. None are good and bad. A tool is only as good as they are properly used. So I know this group has had chainsaw training and those, are great tools and they can be used incredibly safely or they can be used incredibly dangerously. And it's all about using best practices. I have a great and disgusting picture of one of my cousins whose leg, whose calf was split open with a chainsaw because he was doing something really stupid. So it's a chainsaw, you use them every day, but hopefully nobody has their calf split open because it's being, it's a tool and it's being used properly. So anytime we talk about pesticides and their use and risk, I like to share this meme or this quote. For every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And so any kind of information that has to do with this environmental risk and, and pesticides, if something is, is a little bit too pat of an answer, like, oh, it's fine, don't worry about it, or Let's run around with our hair on fire. Those are really clear and simple answers. And we like to have clear, simple answers. We want to know something is good or something is bad. But this is a complex issue and it means that it's a conversation. So the label is the law and the label is a safety fence. And so here's are pretty home with the little white picket fence. And it's something that I would never think of as a safety fence. You may never think of this as a safety fence, but put a two-year-old child in that yard and does, this, does the use of that fence change? And it does. Sometimes we don't think about safety fences very much. You know, we've got a safety fence around a pool. That's pretty apparent. Not, it's more apparent than the picket fence. Sometimes the use of a safety fence is very obvious. And a month ago, I was chasing a four-year-old around an alligator farm and the railings had a much deeper meaning to me than they typically do anytime I'm walking with the railing. So it's very obvious why there's a safety fence. But operating without that safety fence is a bad idea. So follow the pesticide label, convey information to your clients, um, and you are welcome to, to contact me if you have questions about these things. And so with that, I will um, stop sharing and see if the group has any questions.
Thank you, Elizabeth. That was fantastic. So much great information. That chart is unbelievable. I love that chart. I will be uh, posting that up at our on the website tomorrow. Georgia the EPA Arbor. chart or the pesticide chart? The the one both of the one last two with the 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 pesticide and the use and the recommendation. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so if you have a question, we have a few minutes here. Please go ahead and post it in Q&A or in the chat, either one. I'll look in both. I don't see anything coming up right now. I will state, I, I have a question. <laughs> All right. I, I have, I'll answer yours and then I'll start reading questions off. Oh, you see them? Yeah, I see one. So let me start with. Yeah, so go for that first. First, two questions. Do neonics dissipate fully in terms of potential longer-term harm to bees and pollinators? Some of the potential risk I've heard was, you know, concerned about that they stay in a plant longer than other pesticides and have long-term effects that way because they're more systemic and stay in the plant long-term. All right. It depends on what kind of plant you're talking about. So I work with hemlocks and I work with longevity of imidacloprid and hemlocks. So a leaf is going to act as a sink and imidacloprid and other systemic insecticides, which there's many different kinds of systemic insecticides, moves into the tree through the xylem. It's moved up with that water and it goes to the leaf and it goes to the leaf and it goes to the leaf. And for an evergreen, those leaves don't fall, fall off. So they keep that insecticide in there. So for hemlock control, that's great because that means one treatment can last five to seven years. And I'll mention that hemlocks are when pollinated and they don't produce pollen like pine trees. So just put that out there. If it's an ash tree, then those leaves fall off at the end of the year. And, and like a midicloprid only effective for about a year or a year and a half. So it depends on what kind of tissues you're talking about. I'm doing research in North Georgia on floral tissues. I'm looking at the flowers that are within six feet of where I poured a midicloprid on the soil around the base of a tree. And then I go down slope, which is the area of highest risk. I applied the pesticide three weeks before bloom time. So that's when lots of resources are going to these tiny little herbaceous plants and going into those flowers. And so three weeks after application, like, yeah, the residues are high enough to be of concern. A year later, they're not. So it depends on the product. It depends on how much it gets, but it's not like a one answer. Does that make sense? It, it really depends. But measuring pesticide levels and tiny plants that are growing next to where I poured enough insecticide to treat a giant tree is a pretty high risk situation. There's concerns about putting them on nursery plants and, and, and then putting that out there for pollinators. And industry is currently working on those things and looking at delay times with treating plants and then when they're available to consumers. So that kind of work is being done to refine those kind of methods. So they do stay in the plant longer. It depends on if you're talking about the treated plant or a non-target plant. It depends on when you're treating a tree and if you're worried about the pollinators of that tree having effect. And then there are some simple things that, that you can do to reduce risk. For instance, don't treat right before something blooms. That's a really easy one to, to do. Second, all mosquito co spray companies are going willy-nilly, truly bad for pollinators too. It depends on what product they're applying. A lot of the foggers that go through the neighborhood are using BT. BT is, it's actually BTI, and that is a targeted pesticide that is specific to dipter and pest, which are, are flies and mosquitoes. So that is not going to have the risk that spraying a broad spectrum insecticide would. A lot of things could be fixed with communication. So we've had some bee kills with flyovers using NALID. If it, NALID dissipates and, and breaks down pretty quickly. And so, yes, it can cause effects to bees. If you're worried about honeybees, it's, it's covering it up with the hives. So you see how these questions can get much more complicated depending on the situation. Let's see here. Any opinion on discussion or discussion on DDT, specifically the current compositions as they are used in other places in the world currently rather than the original DDT? I do not have information specific to DDT use in other areas. I know that there are some parts of the world where DDT is still used for um, mosquito control, and those are areas that are high malaria. Those are very complicated questions because you're, you're doing trade-offs between malaria deaths, insecticide control, and non-target impacts. And the, 
those are hard questions. And I'll just be perfectly honest about that. And again, that is a conversation. And really, that should be a conversation coming from a med vet entomologist who knows more about the reasons that DDT is used in those areas. Let's see here. All right. I don't know one also wants to talk about how bees are ever given any rest. Oh, how they're worked year round. So this is one about talking about how bees are not given rest. Migratory beekeeping is problematic. It's not a normal occurrence. So that can be problematic for bee populations as well. And those again are honeybees. It's an important product. If you are a honeybee producer, if you're part of moving hives around, if you are in almonds and they are only fertilized by bees, then, then bee mortality is a problem. I'm not making light of bee mortality. I do want to emphasize though, they're not the best indicator of ecosystem health. And that's where we need to turn our focus to native bees. And there are a million great things I can say about native bees, but we don't have time for that. Neil, you had a question, correct? Yeah. My question is, let's see if I can state it properly. So the systemic use, like let's say imidacoprid, if, if you're injecting that in a tree, is it, you know, and let's say it's a native tree with a variety of, of a micro ecosystem is, is I've always had the concern that I'm kind of nuking the whole system for especially doing it systemically. And that given it's only one tree typically, or, you know, sometimes, so I'm not wiping out a whole area, but I was just, I, I, could you speak to that about maybe doing more than you want? <laughs> right. So the question, if you're treating a tree, at least in the capacity that I work with, because I work with a lot of invasive forest pests, we're treating trees because we don't want the tree to die. We're not treating the tree because we don't like the way city mold looks, which is probably a common complaint that you deal with. So the trade-off is tree death or treating mm. sometimes. If the tree dies, then it doesn't have any of the canopy arthropods. Their habitat is gone. So that's a point. A wonderful friend of mine who is now with the USDA did a study on hemlock trees looking at canopy arthropods and, and their populations immediately after hemlock treatment in hemlocks. Okay, so first, hemlock is, it is home to over 400 arthropod species. Wow. So there are a lot of native arthropods that live in those canopies, and that is a wonderful thing. If hemlock dies, then there will be an increase, a community change an increase in detritivores that are killing all the lichens that are breaking down the tree and the fungi, an increase in boring beetles as the tree is broken down and the tree is, is dead. And then there's cascading environmental effects of all of that on the habitat as a whole. If the tree is treated, there is some, there are some initial declines in species richness and abundance initially. It is not a long-term thing. There's some declines for a year, year and a half or so. And then another colleague did a study where they picked it up and did three years after treatment and nine years after treatment. And they find that those communities do recover. So it's not a complete wipeout. But if you're applying a systemic, broad spectrum systemic insecticide to combat a flow or, or fluid feeding pest, then expecting that pesticide to not affect any other fluid feeding insects is not reasonable, all right? And that's where we get into trade-offs. Anytime we make a management decision, there's a trade-off. There's nothing that we do in this arena that is not a trade-off. The choice to treat a tree with an insecticide, what insecticide we use, how much of it we use, the choice to not treat it at all, those things all come with trade-offs. And, and those trade-offs shouldn't be made dismissively. They should be fully considered, but there's, there's really not a situation where we're not going to be making decisions like that and trading off positives and negatives, risk versus benefits. That's so helpful. I mean, because half the, half the battle is getting to, to know what the costs and the benefits are. And you've helped point it out a lot of those today um, or tonight. And I really appreciate this time. So I think with that, we will be closing up at 731. Thank you again, Dr. McCarty. This has been so wonderful. For those of you, remember that we have our first in-person events, November 12th, Tree Climbing Competition and Trees Unitas Conference, November 19th, Premium Workshop, and I hope to see you all there.
And I think Dr. McCarty might said said she might bring her children to do that. I'm going to see if I can make it work. It would be great to go. I would love to. Do you see that it's free? The tree, family tree climb is free. Of I did not see that. It is weather dependent. So um, you might want to text me, you know, if it's too cold or. You know, had- the last rain event, I had a great thing where I saw the giant branch fall out of the tree as I was sitting there the day after the big rain, which was a great reminder of why we don't climb trees after big storms. True that or in a storm, unless you're into tree (laughs) surfing, but that's a whole nother conversation. (laughs) All right, y'all have a great night and thank you again. Great presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank you.